So my name is Laura. This is the Pregnancy Loss Breakout. Um, I'm doing one tomorrow too on birth trauma, so I'm the happy fun person of the Pro-Life Women's Conference. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. Humor is important. So seven years ago, I found myself in a hospital room, sitting on a bed in the emergency room. And I was five months pregnant with my fifth child. Her name is Claire. And I knew something was wrong. And I had an ultrasound, and I was waiting for the doctors. And they came in to do another ultrasound, one that let me see the screen. And it was very still. And I had four living children, so I knew an ultrasound should not look still. And still, the doctor came in the room and said, um, I'm sorry, uh, your baby doesn't have a heartbeat. Here's your bucket. Uh, bring it home. Catch whatever resembles a fetus. Bring it back to us, and we'll dispose of it. And that was it. He sent me on my way. I did not use the bucket. I did not know at the time that I was actually at a pretty high risk of an infection. My baby had passed away several weeks earlier when she was 18 weeks. I ended up being induced. I gave birth to a tiny, beautiful little baby. And I didn't know it at the time, but Claire was the first of seven children that we would welcome, anticipate, and say goodbye to. But it wasn't until I was attending the birth of a tiny little boy named George, the son of one of my dearest friends. She had found out his heart had stopped beating at 10 weeks. And being in the room with her as she labored, as she delivered his tiny body, and supporting her, loving her, and giving dignity to him, that's when I felt what I can only describe as a calling. And so I went through training, lots of training, and I became a birth and a bereavement doula. I'm certified in psychological first aid and trauma. And that's what I do now. In addition to wearing a couple other hats with And Then There Were None and the Guiding Star Project, I assist women and families who have to say hello and goodbye to their little ones. And as I was preparing for this talk today, I kept asking myself, what is it that we want to hear? Because statistics tell me that at least one in three of you sitting in this room have had the experience of having to say goodbye to a baby. And given the nature of this conference and the topic of this session, I'm guessing it's probably most of you. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that we even have to have this conversation. But it's an important one to have. Because I think the answer to my question, what do we want to hear, is that it's possible to heal. We want to hear that healing is possible, that we aren't alone, and that we're normal. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what do I mean when I say heal? We all want this thing called healing, but what is healing? Well, we're going to talk about five steps that we have to take in order to start down this road called healing. It'd be great if you could wake up one day and say, I'm healed, right? I mean, that kind of works with strep throat. <laughs> you get a doctor, you get your antibiotics. Two days later, whole new woman. It works with a paper cut, especially if you have liquid bandage. But this isn't strep throat. This isn't a paper cut. Pregnancy loss, infertility, those are matters of the heart. And the heart takes a lot longer to heal. If we were to give healing a definition, we would define it as the process of integrating our experiences and our reality 
with hope into our everyday life. If we were to define healing, it would be the process of integrating our experiences and our reality with hope into our everyday life. And hope, what is, what is this hope that we're supposed to be integrating? Hope that we can have a rainbow baby. Hope that we can forget. Hope that, what is hope? Hope when it comes down to it, is trusting that somehow, some way, all things really do work for good, even when we don't understand them. And that there is a power in the pain that you are feeling. You see, healing, it's not a destination so much as it is a process that you enter into. So how do we enter into this process? Well, like I said, there are five steps. In my personal experience, in my professional experience, I've narrowed it down to five steps we have to take. And the first one might seem obvious, but it's grieving. But it isn't grieve for grieving's sake. It is grieving so that we can remember. You see, because grief in itself isn't healing. Grief is a step in the process of healing. And there's a real temptation for us to want to be stuck in our grief. Right, because if, if we're grieving, we aren't forgetting. And forgetting would be the worst thing. I remember when we lost our second um, second child, Francis, I was so afraid that people would forget him. I was so afraid that he wouldn't be remembered. Because at the end of the day, we want to know that our babies matter. Their lives matter. Our experience matters. And so we think, okay, well, if we're grieving, then we're not forgetting. Our grief somehow keeps them alive. But constantly grieving isn't healing. Identifying with grief without moving beyond it into being able to remember isn't healing. You see, we aren't here just to be trapped in grief. We are here to be whole and to be healed. And you know, grief is messy. If you grabbed one of these booklets, right? You see this lovely little bell curve? Like grief would be a checklist, right? Well, first I'm gonna be angry and then I'm gonna move into bitterness and then, oh, good, today I am moving into denial. And tomorrow, hopefully, I'll make it back to anger so I can skip over the next couple ones and then I'll be healed. It doesn't work like that. Grief is messy. Grief is like that picture over here. But it's important to go through it. You see, pregnancy is a full body experience, right? As soon as conception takes place, there are massive amounts of hormones that flood your brain. Your brain actually grows. Everything grows. Pregnancy is experienced by your full body, mind, spirit. And so when you say goodbye to a baby, when you lose a baby, that grief is a full body experience too. Your brain, your body, your mind, your spirit, they all grieve. And that manifests itself in different ways. Crying, sadness, confusion, feeling dazed, having aching arms, a compulsion to hold something, even if it's a blanket or a pillow, sleeping too much, sleeping too little, eating too much, eating too little, feeling tired, unmotivated, foggy brained, a desire to avoid babies, a desire to surround yourself with babies, anger, numbness, body aches, weird dreams, and crazy plummeting hormones all make for a very real full body experience of grief. But the trick is, the only way to feel better 
isn't to avoid it. It's to go through it. It's to give yourself permission to not be okay. It's to give yourself permission to take time and to feel all the things you're feeling, even if you're feeling all the things at once, or even if you're feeling nothing at all. Because in going through that process, you cry yourself to sleep every night. And then you cry yourself to sleep three nights a week. This is my experience with Claire for three months. I cried myself to sleep every night. And then there was one night I didn't cry myself to sleep. And I woke up and I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't cry myself to sleep. I hope I'm not forgetting her. And then I started crying. <laughs> Right? That's grief, and that's okay. Because as you go through that process, you'll start to find ways to integrate the life of your child, the life that mattered, into your family. Remembering them, honoring them, and you won't keep crying. And so we take this first step, we allow ourselves to grieve, we give ourselves permission to grieve so that we can move into being able to remember. And eventually remember without all the feelings that confuse us and that are uncomfortable. And then, then we have to take our second step. This second step in this thing called healing. And this one's hard. Because it requires us to surrender our control. You see, our culture, it and our society feeds this lie that we are in control. There are whole industries that are based on this false sense of control. Abortion, birth control, IVF. They all tell us we're in control of our bodies. We're in control of our fertility. And ladies, if that were true, we wouldn't be having this conversation. If I could control what this weird, crazy body of mine could do, I would not have said goodbye to seven children. But it's really tempting to believe that lie, isn't it? There's comfort in feeling like we're in control. Because in giving ourselves this, this false sense of control, it's a way for us to avoid our grief. You know, I developed this ritual after losing seven children, um, you sort of try to find ways to cope and you make little rituals. Not that that's entirely healthy, but it's what I did. And I found myself, after burying my babies, I would go and I would get a haircut. I mean, I usually didn't even need a haircut. I would just go and get one. And sometimes they were even bad haircuts. But I realized that was my way of trying to exercise some sense of control over my body. But what I learned is that that didn't take away my sadness. It certainly didn't bring my baby back. I was still grieving. I had still lost a child. I just had to do all that with a bad haircut now. <laughs> and sometimes it it can help us to remember that when we experience something shocking, something traumatic, and losing a baby is all of those things, that a very real thing happens in our brain. The fight or flight response kicks in. We're flooded with the stress hormone cortisol. And when that happens, our ability to make good decisions, or any decision, is greatly diminished. Our ability to retain information pretty much goes out the window. You see, our brains don't like to feel like they're out of control. And so we find ourselves looking for ways to try to make our brains feel better, to exercise control. But the paradox is that the way we make sense of feeling out of control is not grasping for more, certainly not getting bad haircuts. It's surrendering to the reality that we are not in control. That we do not have control over the powerful thing called fertility. We don't have control over our bodies. 
and that's okay. And so we grieve so we can remember. We surrender our control. And then we have to do something that's probably even harder. I told you I was a happy, fun person. We have to make peace with our bodies. Now, how many of you have really just been alive and heard, love your body, ladies, love your bodies, love your body, love your body, love your body. It's on every woman's magazine cover. It's on all the top. It's, it's everywhere. We are bombarded with this idea that somehow the fulfillment of womanhood is loving our bodies. And in the birth world, it even goes a step further, right? Your stretch marks are your tiger stripes. Love them. There's a thing now you can actually put glitter on all your stretch marks to like, I don't really know. I, I think I would, they'd run out of glitter. Um, <laughs> Right? Lo love your body, your C-section scar. Get a tattoo around your C-section scar. Highlight, that's where your baby was born from. And you know what? If that's you, great. But I gotta tell you something. I do not love my body. I do not love the fact that I don't have a belly button anymore. Like, I mean, it's in there somewhere, but <laughs> I've been pregnant 11 times. It's gone. My kids are like, mommy, where'd your belly button go? I lost it. <laughs> I don't love my scars. The scars from the surgeries that I had because there was an emergency and my baby who had died almost caused me to die. I don't love that. I don't love the stretch marks from the pregnancies that ended in a burial. I don't love this body. I don't love, oh, but you're skinny, right? I hear that too. I'm skinny because I have health problems from the complications from my pregnancies the ones that ended with me crying. I don't love this body. But I have made peace with it. And that is possible. And that is a very important step towards healing. You see, because all of us in this room, ladies, your body tells a story. As women, we know our bodies are designed to create. They're just designed to bring forth life and to nourish it. Those are our feminine abilities. But when it feels like your body failed in one of those areas, it's really tempting to feel like you are somehow less of a woman or less of a mother. And you are not. If you have lost a baby, if you are struggling with infertility, the story that your body tells is not one of failure. It is one of love. It is one of strength. It's a story of survival. We only grieve that which we love. And for those who struggle with infertility, we grieve that which we could have loved and wanted to love. You are no less of a woman and you are no less of a mother if you have only loved your baby for a short time. You are no less of a woman, you are no less of a mother if you do not have a baby to hold. Because ultimately womanhood Motherhood is about loving and letting go. And we can make peace with that. And so I invite you today to make peace with the idea that the story that your body tells is one of loving and letting go. And I'm not going to tell you to love your body but I'm going to ask you to embrace the story that it tells. And so we grieve so we can remember. We surrender our control. We make peace with our bodies. And then it's time for us to find our language. Right? 
Language has power. Words have the power to shape perceptions, and perceptions can shape a culture. Words can hurt, and words can heal. How many of you can relate to these, these two stories? I, uh, I had just lost our fourth um, child. I had my four living children with me in the grocery store, and I was done. I was so raw and so fried, and we had no milk and no eggs and like no cereal. So of course, you know, my four older children were going to starve. And um, so I'm like, fine, we'll go to the store. And they were little. And they're really friendly kids. So we're waiting in line to check out. I don't want to talk to anybody. And the lady in front of me, of course, wants to talk. Oh, your children, they're beautiful. Thank you. How old are they? I tell her their ages. Do you have any more? Uh, um, okay, how do I answer this woman? If I tell her I have more yes, but they died, I'm going to cry. If I say no, I'm denying that my other babies who were very real, I held them, didn't matter, and I can't do that either, and I don't want this lady asking me questions about my children who died, and I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable, so I'm standing there like, such a simple question. She was just making conversation. And so I was like, okay, fine, I'll, um, I'll, just, I'll just be honest. Uh, yes, I do, but, but they died. Ugly tears. She looks shocked and horrified. And I run out of the grocery store crying. Okay, fine, never doing that again. So a little while later, I'm out in public again. My kids with me. Oh, your children are so cute. Thank you. How old are they? I told them their ages. Do you have any more? I don't want to go through this again. I'm just going to say no. No. Oh, I just denied my children. And my little daughter, who hears everything and notices everything, goes, that's not true, mommy. That got real awkward real fast. <laughs> and I left crying again. And so finally I said, this is ridiculous. I cannot dread going out in public and having these conversations with women if I'm just going to end up crying no matter what I say. And so I sat down with a mirror and I practiced. I have four living children and I have seven children who are waiting for me in heaven. I have four children at home. Unspoken implication is that there are others somewhere else <laughs> for the people I don't really want to have a conversation with. Yes, I have four living children at home. End of story, moving on. I had to find my language. I had to find the words that would both validate the experience, my reality, and that I would be comfortable speaking. And so I encourage you to find your language. Maybe that means standing in the bathroom and talking to yourself until you can say the words without crying. Maybe it means it, it's practicing different phrases, different answers. I really did. I probably looked like a crazy person if anyone could have seen me because I was just talking in this mirror for like an hour and a half. But that was so therapeutic to find my language. And what you'll find is that the more you speak to the truth of your reality, the more power you remove from words to hurt you. And instead, those conversations become vehicles for healing. So find your language. So step one, we grieve so we can remember. Number two, we surrender our control. Number three, we make peace with our bodies. We find our language. And then it's time for us to ask, what can I do? You see, the first four steps of healing, they involve grief and they involve moving out of grief. And all of that is interior, internal, inside work. 
But healing, in order for it to stick, it has to move from the internal to the external. And you know, I, I have some acquaintances who have been through various 12-step programs. And I've always been impressed that the 12 steps, like, I don't even really know them um, I, in order, but I remember looking through um, one of the, the books that my friend had, had given me to look at and realizing that those steps move from all inside to outside. And the 12th step is helping others. And there's great wisdom in that. Because when we can move out of ourselves, it forces us to integrate our experiences into the way that we are living. It forces us in a good, healthy way to do that definition of healing, integrating our reality into our everyday life. It forces us to live in this new normal that we have, right? Because when you lose a child, you have a whole new normal to get used to. There's a great, um, kind of a great definition of humanity. It came from a document called Gaudium et Spes, and it says that a man, in our case a woman, cannot fully find him or herself except through a sincere gift of self. Isn't that so beautiful? We cannot truly know ourselves except when we make a gift of ourselves to others. Gosh, isn't that motherhood? Whether your baby lived for minutes, whether you never got to hold them, you have made a sincere gift of yourself to that child. And there is great healing in making yourself a gift to others. And who better, who better to support, to love, to encourage other women who have experienced this horrible thing called pregnancy loss than those of us who have walked it. And so our fifth step, this what can I do that helps us continue our own healing comes with three very easy but very powerful things to do. The first is to just make yourself available to listen. See, I have three boys and they love fishing. And I've noticed that when they are talking to people, about fishing, somehow the little fish that they caught was this big. They love to tell stories. And then after they talk about the fish that they caught, they like to show all their scars, right? This was from when I went rock climbing. This was when he whacked me with the bat, don't tell mom. <laughs> this, they know, all, it's like this whole map of all of their brave experiences. I mean, the oldest is only 12 you'd think he fought in a war. <laughs> now women, we don't tend to do that, you know, with our scars. We're like, scars? I don't have any. <laughs> but we like to tell birth stories. As a doula, I've heard lots. I was in labor for 48 hours. <laughs> oh, honey, that's nothing. I gave birth in my bathtub. <laughs> the epidural didn't take. Had to do the whole thing natural didn't even take a class. <laughs> right? We love birth stories. And if you have lost a child, you have a birth story too. And it's so beautiful when you can share it with someone. Right? The times where you've had someone tell me. Tell me what happened. Tell me about your experience. Tell me about your baby. That made a huge difference, didn't it? So be that person for someone else. Listen. Tell me your story. Tell me your baby's name. May I speak your baby's name? 
Because when we listen, we end up validating. And that is the second best thing that you can do for someone else who has experienced a loss. Remember I told you about Francis? I was so afraid that he'd be forgotten. You see, when we lost Claire, I was five months along. Everybody knew I was pregnant. You'd get my body, like, hears the word pregnant and goes <laughs> So by five months, I looked like a tank. Everybody knew. So when she died, we got cards and flowers and people dropped off food and I felt like she was so loved. But Francis, he only lived for six weeks. He was tiny. I didn't get to hold him. I didn't get to bury him. There were no cards. There were no flowers. There was no food. It was like he didn't matter. So I went and I got a tattoo of his name all across my back. Remember what we said about not making really great decisions when you're grieving? <laughs> really big. <laughs> Validate. Validate the experience of those women in your life who find themselves in this unfortunate club that none of us wanted to belong in. This club that had to say goodbye to their babies. Send the card. Send the flowers. Send the meal. Can I come and can I do a load of laundry for you? Validate. Listen. And then if you want to take it a step further, act. I travel the country giving these talks. I am the only bereavement doula in a three hour radius of where I live and that serves three major cities. There are not enough of us. There are not enough women who are willing to say, hey, I know what this is like. I'm gonna crochet baby hats and bring them to my hospital because every baby gets a hat, right? I'm going to donate to some of the beautiful charities and organizations that are helping and assisting women through loss. We have some of them here at the conference. Please stop by their tables. Prenatal Partners for Life is a personal favorite. Guiding Star, I'm helping write, um, actually I wrote the pamphlets on pregnancy loss for Guiding Star. There's so many. What can I do? There's something all of us can do. We can all listen, we can all validate. And if you want to do more, I encourage you to act. Explore what that looks like. And you'll find that as you do, you might not wake up one day and shout, I'm healed. But you will wake up one day and say, I'm okay. And ladies, that's healing. Thank you. <laughs>